there are always two sides to every story. And sometimes there are many different pieces to a story, like a jigsaw puzzle. And like a jigsaw puzzle, you have to fit all of the jagged puzzle pieces together. And they don't always fit with exact precision. Welcome to The Secret Sits. I'm your host, John Dodson. Join us every Thursday as we uncover the secrets behind the world's most fascinating true crime cases. You can find all episodes of The Secret Sits for free on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you are hearing, reach out to us on Instagram and Facebook at The Secret Sits Podcast or on Twitter at Secret Sits Pod. Now, on with our story. This is a story of three sisters who are bound together through tragedy, chaos, and perseverance. But to get to their story, we need to go back back to the 1950s and to a quintessential small town called Battleground, Washington, situated 12 miles northeast of Vancouver. It was there that recent high school graduate Lara Stalling first met Les Watson. Now, Les Watson was 10 years older than Lara, and he had quite the reputation around town as a smooth talker who could pour on the charm when he had to. He was also quite handsome and was popular with the ladies. Les and his mother, Anne, owned a pair of nursing homes in the town, and Les also owned a local bowling alley, which had a 12-seat snack bar. Lara Stalling was working the counter at this snack bar in 1958. Lara had long, curly blonde hair, which she wore back in a ponytail. This would swing from side to side as she worked the counter taking orders. She had striking blue eyes, and she was obviously beautiful and very smart. In fact, she was working at the snack counter to save money to enroll in college. After a quick courtship, the couple married in 1960 in Vancouver. But only Lara's family attended the wedding, albeit against their better judgment. And the reason that only Lara's family attended was simply because Les did not even invite his side of the family. One morning after their nuptials, the phone rang, and Lara answered. To her surprise, it was Les's first wife calling from California. When are you coming to get these damn kids? She spat into the phone. Lara was shocked and knew nothing about this. I mean, she knew about the ex-wife and the kids, but Les had told her nothing about picking up these children, nor that they were to come and live with Les and her. After confronting Les about this, he revealed that his ex-wife was a depressive alcoholic and she was incapable of raising the children. With no other options, Lara agrees, and they go and pick up Shelley, who was six, and Chuck, who was three. The third child, Paul, was still an infant, and he would stay with his birth mother until they could be separated. Instantly, there was a strange dynamic between Shelley and her little brother. Chuck didn't speak a word. Shelley spoke for him and held total control over her little brother. And as far as Shelley's relationship with Lara, Lara said, she told me every single day that she hated me, I'm not joking. It was honestly every day. Les's ex-wife, Sharon, never communicated with Shelley or Chuck ever again. Not a phone call. Not a birthday card. Nothing. In 1967, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office called the Watsons in Battleground and informed Les that Sharon had been murdered in a seedy motel room. They believed she was performing sex work. They asked Les to come down and identify the body and collect his son, Paul, who was now motherless and homeless. 
Les did not actually want to go and collect his son, as he knew that Paul had a myriad of behavioral problems. But Lara knew it was the right thing to do, so she sent Les to go collect Paul and bring him home. When Shelley was told about what happened to her mother, the now 13-year-old didn't seem the least bit interested. She barely reacted, and she never asked about her mother ever again. Paul, it turns out, acts almost like a feral child. He had almost zero impulse control and no social skills. Lara said he was like an animal. He even carried a switchblade. The Watsons spent all of their time and energy on the weekends trying to make happy and memorable experiences for the children. They would go boating in the summer months, and they would go skiing on the slopes of Mount Hood during the winter months. But nothing pleased Shelley, unless it was her idea. She would pitch fits and just refuse to go with the family. Every little thing was drama to Shelley, and soon her behavior would change from disruptive and ungrateful to dark and vengeful. She especially resented her siblings, as every bit of attention paid to them was attention not paid to her. At one point, she used to chop up bits of glass and put them into the bottom of her sibling's shoes. Now, you may be wondering, where does a child get the ideas and the gumption to do something like this? Well, look no further than her paternal grandmother, Anna Watson. Anna Watson was born in Fargo, North Dakota. She was tall and muscled with sinewy traces of tendons that ran from her neck down the collar of her blouse. She tipped the scales at more than 250 pounds, and her left foot dragged behind her as she walked. And like her granddaughter, Shelley, Anna was right about everything. One day, when Lara went to the nursing home Anna owned to pick up Shelley, who would sometimes go to the nursing home to see Anna rather than heading home like she was supposed to. Lara ran into Mary and Pearlie, two nurses that worked at the nursing home. Lara noticed that Pearlie's hair was wet, and she asked her about it. Mary told Lara that Anna had been upset about something she had done, so she held her head inside one of the toilets and kept flushing it. Lara was shocked at this behavior, even for Anna. In March of 1969, Shelley is not 15 years old when her first real strike hits. After not returning home from school and not being found at the nursing home, Lara called Shelley's school. The principal of the school told Lara that Shelley had been taken to Juvenile Hall and they could not see her. After going to the Juvenile Detention Center and trying to gain access to Shelley, Lara and Les were informed that Shelley had accused Les of raping her. The Watson family called their family doctor down to the center to perform an examination on Shelley, which proved that she had never had any type of sexual molestations performed on her. And Lara found a True Confessions magazine in her room with the cover story, I was raped at 15 by my dad and used this as more proof of her stepdaughter's manipulations. After this incident, the Watsons placed Shelley into a boarding school, from which she was quickly ejected. The couple then had difficulties finding another school to place Shelley in, as her reputation was quickly preceding her. The last boarding school she was placed in was St. Mary of the Valley. Lara and Les thought that the strict Catholic nuns would certainly straighten Shelley out. At the end of the school year, however, the nuns told the Watsons that they would not accept Shelley the following year. The Watsons tried to pay extra, but the nuns said that there was no price high enough for them to take back Shelley. The next unwitting victim of the Shelley monster machine was Les Watson's sister, Katie, who lived on the East Coast. After a few weeks, Katie phoned and said that Shelley had told her everything. She and her husband Frank had decided to have Shelley stay with them for the coming school year. Frank was a mining engineer and the president of a coal company. 
And when Shelley was not even 18 years old, she had already met her future husband. So let's not forget that Shelley is a knockout, and she caught the attention of a lot of local schoolboys in Murraysville, Pennsylvania, while staying with her aunt and uncle. She began dating Randy Rivardo her senior year, but after graduation, Randy had to stay in Pennsylvania to earn money for college while Shelley moved back to Washington to work at her father's nursing home. Toward the end of the summer, Shelley called Randy and offered him a job as the handyman at her father's nursing home. Les also offered him a rent-free apartment so that he could save money faster. However, this was also a ploy from the Watsons to have Shelley live with Randy so they didn't have to put up with her destructive behavior any longer. Shelley and Randy, both 19, married in February of 1973. None of Randy's relatives showed up for the wedding, because unbeknownst to him, Shelley never sent any of their invitations. After the wedding, they moved into a 40-foot trailer on a plot of land owned by her father, which Shelley hated. She also constantly complained of menstrual cramps, which would cause her to miss work. This would go on the entire month until Les finally had to let her go. Shelley would just go to work at another relative's nursing home until they also fired her for pulling the same thing. Then she would go back to her father's nursing home until he fired her again. And this cycle just went on and on until finally no one would hire her. Shelley also brought no benefits to her household. She refused to cook or clean. All she would do is lie around and yell at everyone around her about what they should be doing. Now bored at home, Shelley's manipulations quickly escalated. Randy bought her a car, and when it wasn't the car she had wanted, she feigned an attempted suicide by taking pills. She was rushed to the hospital where they pumped her stomach and only discovered a couple of aspirin. One day after, Randy returned from his classes at College Park. He entered the house to Shelley sobbing with her face covered in scratches. She said a man had broken in and attacked her and raped her, and that he had stolen one of their guns. Well, after police came and questioned her, it turned out that she'd made it all up, and she had inflicted the wounds on herself. Shelley became pregnant around this time, and she acted like she owned the entire town of Battleground. She would go to shops and take whatever she wanted, and she would just tell them to put things on credit, which she never paid. Randy's family came from Pennsylvania to see them, but Shelley went into her room and refused to come out for their entire visit. After they had returned home back east, Shelley found some clothes Randy's sister had forgotten, so she packaged them up and sent them back to her. When she received the completely intact box in the mail, she opened it and found all the clothes inside had now been cut into strips. Shelley simply said, someone at the post office must have done it. In February of 1975, Nikki came into the world. She looked like a clone of Shelley's perfect attributes, and Shelley was telling anyone who would listen how excited she was to be a mother. And for some reason, Shelley decided not to bring her new baby back to her home in Battleground, electing to instead bring Nikki to her parents' home in Vancouver. And she stayed there for three months until Randy finally put his foot down and made her move back home to Battleground with their infant daughter. Shelley immediately started going back to her old ways, and the relationship with Randy deteriorated quickly. Shelley made him sleep in his car, and he was forced to give her any money he made, which she spent on tawdry things that the family didn't need, all while barely being able to afford basic necessities. Randy had had enough and his parents sent him money to fly back home and leave Shelley for good. Two weeks later, Shelley contacted Randy at his parents' house and professed her love for him. He flew her out to the East Coast, but after only two weeks, she had already once again spent all of his money and alienated his family 
to the point where even Randy's grandparents couldn't stand her and told him to get a divorce. After stealing Randy's tax return check and getting a different man to forge his signature so she could cash it, Shelly just disappeared. And Lara was called and told to come pick up Nikki. Shelly stayed gone with no contact, no explanations. Until one day, a year after her disappearance, she just showed up at Lara's house to collect Nikki, whom Lara had been raising and falling head over heels for. Shelly cut Nikki off from her father's entire side of her family, telling her that they never attempted to contact her, which we will find out is completely untrue. Lara and Les were concerned that Shelly was leaving Nikki at home alone while she went out, so they went over to her new apartment in Vancouver. Neither Shelly nor Nikki was home, but a neighbor across the hall named Danny said he had a key to the apartment and he let them in. There, they found things that Shelly had taken from their own home. Not long after this, Shelly and Danny were married, and at 24 years old, Shelly was already on her second marriage. And in August of 1978, Samantha was born, once again carrying all of her mother's beautiful attributes. The marriage to Danny lasted nearly five years, which were full of fights and crying and holes being punched into walls. But Danny was always great with the girls, and Nikki recalled that she always thought of Danny as her dad. In 1983, at 29 years old, Shelley already had a new guy in her web. Dave Notek, who by all accounts was mild-mannered and probably easily controlled by Shelley. And as the new couple grew closer, Shelley made a tearful admission to Dave after a doctor's appointment. I have cancer, and I probably won't make it to 30 years old, she told Dave. So... After some more time together, and Shelly constantly playing the cancer card, Dave began to fear for Nikki and Sammy's future if Shelly were to pass away. So on December 28, 1987, he became Shelly's third husband. One of the witnesses for the wedding was Kathy Loreno, Shelly's hairdresser and best friend. No one knew at the time, but Kathy would end up playing a far bigger role in the no-tech marriage than anyone could have ever imagined. This marriage, just like all of her others, was a mess. Dave treated Shelley well and never laid a hand on her, but Shelley did not return the favor, constantly berating Dave, trying to make him feel worthless. He would spend nights at his parents' house, friends' couches, or even just camping out in the woods, anything that would spare him a night away from Shelley's torturous attitude. They eventually moved into a new house in Old Willapa, a big, beautiful craftsman. Nikki and Sammy had separate rooms upstairs, separated by an open play area, and the house was charming and comfortable. It was also the place where everything bad started. Nikki and Sammy found out quickly that anything in this house could be a weapon for Shelly to discipline her children with, and when something seemed to work, Shelly looked for ways to make it even more brutal. The act of beating her children seemed to fuel her and excite her, and Shelly would beat the children day and night. One night, she dragged Nikki into a walk-in closet and beat her, Nikki apologizing profusely for anything she may have done to set off her mother. Shelly shoved Nikki, and an exposed nail in the wall impaled Nikki's face. Only then did Shelly finally back off. The girls would wear extra layers of clothes to bed in case they were drugged from their bed in the middle of the night and forced to sleep out in the yard. But through all of this, the girls had each other. Nikki's punishments were always worse than Sammy's. Shelley had now developed a new form of punishment, which she called wallowing. Shelley would wake Nikki in the middle of the night, in the dead of winter, 
and she would make Nikki get out of bed and strip down naked. She would drag her down the stairs, berating her the entire time, and take her outside to a mud puddle. Nikki would have to roll around in the mud puddle, wallowing, while Dave had to stand there and spray her with the hose. The water freezing into shards of glass all around her, and Sammy watched from her bedroom window, wishing she was being punished with her sister, so that at least she wouldn't be alone in her suffering. After these wallowing sessions, Shelley would run a bath of only hot water and force the freezing Nikki into the steaming bathtub with no humanity. Shelley eventually banished Nikki to her room, and because there were no locks on the doors, Shelley would use a butcher's knife wedged into the door frame to keep her child inside. Nikki can't really remember how long these punishments lasted, but she believes it was for an entire summer. One day, Shelley came to Nikki's room and gave her a five-gallon bucket and simply said, use this. Nikki didn't have to ask her mother what she was supposed to use it for. During Nikki's time imprisoned in her room, Sammy was also not allowed to see her. Nikki could come out to empty her bucket, or sometimes Sammy would be let into the room to empty the bucket. But Shelly would be standing right there in the door, so the two close-knit sisters being kept from one another was just another of Shelly's forms of torture. While Shelly slept during the day, Sammy would throw pine cones up at her sister's window, and they would talk in whispers, Sammy from the ground outside, and Nikki from her upstairs room's window. During this time, their dog had puppies, so one day while Shelly slept, Nikki tied two bathrobe belts together and lowered her bucket down to Sammy. Sammy took the bucket and gave it a good scrubbing, and then placed two of the new puppies into the bucket. Nikki raised the bucket up to her room and cuddled with the puppies for as long as she dared before sending them back down to her sister. Eventually, Nikki would be let out of her room. But before long, Shelly was back to her same old ways of chasing Nikki through the house, screaming, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. And on this occasion, when Shelly caught up to Nikki, she shoved her through the glass panel door. Nikki was immediately in shock, and blood started to pour from dozens of cuts all over her body. It was in this moment that Shelly said something that no one in this family had ever heard. Shelly said, I'm sorry. Shelly and Sammy took Nikki to the bedroom and cleaned her up and ran a proper bath for her to get into. As soon as she got into the bath, the water ran red. Shane Watson was Shelly's nephew by her brother Paul. Paul had been in and out of jail and prison, and Shelly told Dave that they should take the boy in. But Dave was resistant to the idea based on the family's household income. But Shelly got her way, just like she did for everything, and they took in the 10-year-old boy. He almost immediately started calling Shelly and Dave mom and dad. Shane's presence in the house did nothing to change Shelly's behavior. Shane was essentially Shelly's new slave. She gave him constant chores and worked him to the bone. He had a room in the basement, but Shelly would take his things one at a time. First his pillow, then his blanket, then his bed. Next, Shelly took away his shower privileges, which were only one shower every other week to begin with. So now in school, Shane went from being the cool new kid to the smelly, greasy, weird boy. Lara came down to visit the family unexpectedly, as this was the only way to make sure that they would be home for her visit. And she spent time with the girls upstairs in their rooms and noted that their rooms were very clean and organized. Lara then wanted to see her grandson's room, and so she went down the basement stairs with Shelley following right behind. When Lara saw that he was simply sleeping on a mattress on the floor, 
she gave Shelley money to buy him furniture for his room. Nikki and Shane became like prisoners of war, binding themselves together against Shelley. Sammy, at this point, was still the favorite child and not treated quite as harshly as the two older children. One of Shelley's favorite punishments for Nikki and Shane was to make them both strip down naked in the living room in front of everyone, and then she would make them slow dance together while nude. She would do this in front of Sammy and Dave, who were both powerless to stop her sadistic antics. Kathy Loreno first showed up on the scene as a friend, then a babysitter. Then she moved into the house with the family. The reason for this addition to the household was that in 1988, the now 34-year-old Shelley was pregnant with her third child, which added to the holiday spirit around the house as Christmas was fast approaching. Kathy's meager things were set up in the open play area between the two girls' rooms upstairs. Kathy was 30 years old and out of work, and she was simply grateful to be with such good friends. Nikki watched this new interloper with skeptical and anxious eyes, constantly scrutinizing her mother's bossy best friend. Tori Notek was born in the first week of June 1989, she was a preemie with underdeveloped lungs. Shelley would constantly claim that Tori had quit breathing, but she would revive her, making her the savior. And in the middle of the night, Tori's medical instruments would sound the alarm that something was wrong, and Nikki and Sammy would rush downstairs to the sound of the commotion just to see their mother holding the baby, telling them that she had once again saved her and everything was all right. One night, Nikki was walking down the stairs and saw her mother holding a pillow over Tori's little helpless face. And when Shelley noticed Nikki walking down the stairs, she scooped up the baby. Everything is fine, I've got her, she proclaimed. But Nikki had seen what her mother was doing, and it made her think back to when she was a little girl, and she would wake up with a pillow over her face and her mother would instantly be there to save her. One year, on Sammy's birthday, everyone was gathered around the birthday girl out at the picnic table on the front porch of the house. Shelley had gotten Sammy a stuffed toy which was very popular that year, and Kathy gave Sammy a real gold necklace with a gold heart on it. Sammy asked her to put it on right away. It was real jewelry, And it was special, because Sammy thought Kathy was special. Everyone was having a great time, until Shelley asked which was Sammy's favorite gift. Sammy grinned from ear to ear and proclaimed, Kathy's present. I love it so much. Isn't it pretty? Later that evening, Shelley beat Sammy with a belt and called her an ungrateful brat. This is when Sammy realized that her favorite present must always be the one that she received from Shelley. Lara and Les Watson had been divorced for a couple of years now, and Lara was thriving in her career in the medical field and living in Vancouver when she received a frantic call from Shelley telling her that she had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is when she learned about Kathy living in the house and that Kathy would be helping Shelley with her treatment and with taking care of the house and the children. But during subsequent phone calls to the house, Lara could hear yelling in the background. And when she asked Nikki what was going on, Nikki responded with, Mom's just mad at Kathy again. Finally, after months of quote-unquote treatment for her cancer, Lara called to speak to Shelley again, and this was where Lara laid it all out on the line. She confronted Shelley and told her that she thought Shelley was making up the cancer stuff again. Shelley immediately slammed down the phone, and Kathy picked up, asking what Lara had said to upset her. Lara told Kathy exactly what she had said, to which Kathy just laid down the phone. Next to pick up was Dave 
and he couldn't believe Lara's line of thoughts either. He accused her of being the worst mother ever. Lara asked Dave, Do you go to the hospital with her? He responded, Yes. Do you go into her appointments and treatments with her? Dave answered, No, Shelly is too proud. I wait in the waiting room in the lobby all day for her. Lara begins getting even more suspicious. All day, she asks? The treatment should take no more than an hour. Dave replied, No, we go and I wait all day, eight hours, while she gets her treatment. Lara knew better and knew that Shelley was probably out to a movie and lunch while her trusting husband just sat in a hospital lobby waiting room, waiting on nothing. The situation between Shelley and Kathy quickly escalated. Shelley would hide food under Kathy's bed and in the morning confront her about it, accusing Kathy of sleepwalking and sleep eating. After this went on for a while, Shelley confronted Kathy in front of Nikki and Shane, telling her that she had been sleepwalking the night before and that she had walked into Shane's room completely nude and tried to have sex with him. Kathy, a woman in her 30s, and Shane, still an underage boy. Kathy proclaimed her innocence, but Shelley looked at Shane and said, Tell her. Shane responded with, Yes, you were in my room. I saw everything. Later, Shane told Nikki that he had made everything up to go along with Shelley. Shelley then started to punish Kathy for things that Kathy didn't even remember doing. Shelley telling her that these things had been done during her sleepwalking. Shelley started taking away Kathy's privileges and her things until Shelley was left with just one bra, one pair of panties, and a muumuu. After that, the muumuu vanished, and eventually, so did the underwear. After that, Kathy was forced to do her chores around the house in the nude. She had to ask Shelley for permission to use the toilet. She could no longer bathe unless Shelley approved it in advance, and eventually all her bathing had to be done outside with the garden hose. Shelley, now using Kathy for all of her mind games and abuse, meant that the children were not being punished nearly as often. But that came at a steep price. Their world was one of looking the other way, and it kept them safe from Shelley. But it also led them to accept things that would come to haunt them forever. Shelley began to use the children to torture Kathy, shooting rubber bands at her as she did her house chores because Shelley thought she was going too slow. Shane did most of Shelley's bidding when it came to Kathy. If she told him to kick or punch Kathy, he would do it with fervor and gusto because if he didn't, he would end up having to wallow or he would be duct taped naked to a wall. And because for all of her faults, and as much as Shane hated her, she was the closest thing he had ever had to a mother. Shelley's reign of terror over Kathy only continued to escalate. Kathy was made to hide in Shelley's closet anytime there was company over. And when the family went on camping trips, they took Kathy with them. But she was made to ride in the trunk of the car. While camping, Kathy had to sleep on the ground, beneath the car. One day, Shelley and the girls needed to go to the laundromat, and she said to them, Take Kathy, we can't leave her alone today. So the girls went and placed the bags of laundry in the trunk, and Kathy climbed into the trunk with the dirty laundry. When they arrived at the laundromat, Kathy stayed in the trunk of the car while the laundry was being done. Sammy, being concerned for Kathy, went out to the car to check on her. Shelley had warned them not to let her out, so she spoke to Kathy through the trunk. How are you doing in there? Sammy asked. I'm fine. How's the laundry going? Kathy asked. We're doing great, Kathy, Sammy replied. What's the weather like out there? Kathy asked. Nice. Real nice, Sammy replied. And the conversation was just like that, non-confrontational. Shelley's secondary victim to Kathy 
was almost always Shane. When he would do something she didn't like, she would make him strip down naked in front of the girls. She would then duct tape his ankles and wrists together and spread icy hot on his genitals, which would make him howl with anguish. He tried to run away several times, but Shelley always found him and coaxed him back with her fake loving mother routine. Shelley had decided that Tori needed more room for her crib now, so she forced Kathy to move down into the small utility room in the basement. It had a concrete floor and bare studs for walls. Sammy felt sorry for her and brought down several posters to hang up. Kathy argued with Sammy not to hang them up, but she insisted. Well, of course, as soon as Shelley saw them, she threw a fit. That evening, which was freezing outside, Shelley and Dave took the naked Kathy outside and walked her up to the top of the hill behind the house. The children, watching from their second-story windows, not sure what the punishment would be until they saw Kathy being forced to sit down on the frozen ground, nude, and slide down the hill. Once at the bottom, she had to stand up and climb back up the hill and do it over and over and over for what seemed like hours. The next morning, Sammy cried as she went outside and saw a solid red stripe running down the hillside which had been made from the blood pouring from Kathy's nude backside. The Secret Sits will return in just a moment. So we've got an animal approximately seven and a half feet tall, human-like arms and legs. The face is not like that of a man or an ape, but something in between. Additionally, the hands have sparse hair, yet the palms are bare, with five digits including an opposable human-like thumb. Not human. Repeat, not human. Subscribe to Bigfoot Classified today as we explore what may be the biggest Bigfoot cover ups in history. Visit BigfootClassified.com and subscribe to Bigfoot Classified, available where you get your podcast. On April 15th, 1991, The Notex all piled into the car for a drive to Washaway Beach. Tori sat up front with her parents, and the three older children rode in the back seat, and Kathy rode in the trunk of the car. Kathy was growing weaker and weaker by the day. Images captured on the family's camcorder showed a woman in failing health. Her two front teeth had started to decay into two black nubs and her skin sagged where it had once been full. The family bought a shingle-sided white farmhouse on Monaghan Landing Road in Raymond in the summer of 1992. The house was a mess and needed a ton of work. Dave was handy, but he was not at home much because of his job. The kids hated this house, but because it was situated close to the road, they hoped for a reprieve from their outdoor punishments. But their dreams were quickly dashed as they realized that the way the house was positioned, neighbors, nor passing motorists, would be able to see them or help them. The house was small, around 1,600 square feet for all seven of its inhabitants. Two bedrooms upstairs, with the main bedroom downstairs, and only one bathroom, which sat directly next to Shelley and Dave's room downstairs. Tori slept in the main room with Shelly and Dave. Shane slept in Nikki's closet on a blanket, and Kathy slept on the living room floor. All of her personal belongings had been reduced down to what would fit into one small paper bag. One day, Shelly noticed that she couldn't find Kathy, who Shelly had now made move outside into the pump house. Shelly sent the kids out to look for her in the woods, fearing she had ran away. Shelly went and got into the car to look for Kathy, and a few hours later, she returned to the house with Kathy in tow. She had found her at the mall with a friend. Shelly explained that after a private conversation with Kathy in the mall restroom, Kathy had agreed to come back home. 
Shelley let Kathy begin sleeping in the house again, but a few days later, she was moved back out to the pump house as punishment for running away. Kathy tried to escape again and again, one time even running away while she was still naked. One day, Shelley made Dave drag Kathy across the yard to be punished for something or another she had done. Kick her, Dave, Shelley yelled, and Dave, as always, complied and kicked Kathy square in the head with his steel-toed boot. Kathy was confined to the pump house, the smallest of all of the outbuildings on the property, and she would be sequestered there for days and even weeks at a time, padlocked in from the outside. One day, when Shelley needed to go on some runs, she told Shane that he was in charge of Kathy. Shane and Nikki went out to the pump house and unlocked the door. Kathy winced at the sunlight beaming in. She looked haggard and hardly had any of her teeth or hair left. Shane and Nikki tried to free her and let her go, but she said that Shelley would just find her again and bring her back. When Shane unlocked the door to let her run free, it was probably her last chance. Kathy just didn't have any fight left in her. She had simply given up. But Shelley had not given up. Everything Kathy did was wrong. One evening, Kathy needed to use the bathroom, but Shelley was asleep, so she could not ask permission. Kathy used a Tupperware container to do her business in, and Shelley woke up and found Kathy in the kitchen with the container and lost it. Shelley grabbed an electrical cord and started lashing Kathy with it. Kathy, who was a large woman at six feet tall and outweighed Shelley originally, was being drug around the kitchen by her hair with what little she had left. The adrenaline Shelley gained during her beatings of Kathy almost gave her superhuman strength. Shelley instructed Dave to build a seesaw-type device with a bucket of water at one end. After it was constructed, Shelley made Dave tie Kathy to the long board face down while nude, and then they used the device to waterboard her over and over and over again. After more and more abuse from Shelley, Kathy was nearly gone physically and mentally. Shelley decided to become the doting and devoted best friend again and had the kids go get Kathy from the pump house and bring her inside for a shower. It took a Herculean effort just to get Kathy to the house. She could barely walk, and she was covered in bruises and scrapes, almost no hair or teeth left. Nikki and Shane got her to the bathroom, but when they tried to get her into the shower, she was too unstable, and the glass shower door fell and shattered on the bathroom floor, with Kathy falling down right along with it. She did not have the strength to stand and was rolling around in the glass. She was bleeding from all over, and some of the cuts desperately needed medical attention. Shelley, fancying herself a nurse, because of the time she worked at the nursing homes, just wrapped Shelley in bandages and left it at that. Dave had been building an extension off of the side of the house for a new laundry room. Shelley decided that would be Kathy's new room. One day after school, Sammy waited until her mother was not looking and she snuck into the laundry room to check on Kathy. Kathy, I came to see if you're doing okay, Sammy said. Kathy gurgled, but didn't respond. Kathy, can you hear me? Sammy asked. Kathy nodded and her eyes rolled backwards. Sammy started to cry, realizing Kathy needs help. Dave had been driving for a long time, and was not at home for long stretches of time. When he arrived home after a job in July of 1994, he heard strange sounds coming from the laundry room. Dave asked what the sound was, but Shelley said, It's just Kathy. She's fine. Shelley then took Sammy and Tori to go pick Nikki up from her dishwasher job at the Sea Star restaurant. She's getting better, Shelley insisted as she walked out the door. Shane, 
was in the kitchen, washing dishes. And Dave kept hearing the noises coming from the laundry. He went to check on her and called out to Shane. What's wrong with her? Shane walked to the laundry room and stood there like a petrified tree. I don't know, he responded. Dave then noticed that Kathy had stopped breathing, and he did not know what to do. He later said, I know I should have called 911, but with everything that had been going on, I didn't want the cops there. I didn't want Shell in trouble. I just freaked out. I really did. I didn't know what to do. But no matter what Dave and Shane did, it was too late. Kathy Loreno was dead. Shelly Notek rules her house with an iron fist. But how far is she willing to go to assert her dominance and control over everyone around her? Join us next week when we will continue our story. The Secret Sits podcast is researched and written by me, John Dodson. Audio engineering by Gabriel Dodson. Original logo artwork provided by Tony Lay.